think we're recording. Wonderful. So, hey, uh, Rob. Jersey. <laughs> How's it going? <laughs> going really good. Really good. Uh, how, how are things with you? I'm I'm doing good. I'm actually getting a full night's sleep. I don't know about you. I, I understand that you're not. A uh, lot of exciting things going on. You yeah. know, this uh, fun th- uh, lean into art service uh, and, and things surrounding it. It's, it's super exciting. And uh, yeah, I have a tendency when I get really into things like that, uh, eh, I stay up and go with the flow and keep on working on it. You find yourself pushing yourself like another 15 minutes, another 15 minutes, another 15 minutes. The next thing you know, it's four o'clock in the morning. Yeah. It's, you know, checking yeah. out the goal list and saying like, ah, that one doesn't look too tough. Let me see how fast I can do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, that's, and then the next day you wake up uh, feeling kind of uh, woozy and haggard and there's no amount of coffee in the world that can save you after that point, right? Yeah. Uh, let's see. How do you balance that? Uh, I, how do you how do you how do you, how do you uh, get out of that that mess? Because that that can be a really vicious cycle that you find yourself in. Oh, it can be, and uh, it, it's helpful to to see it and to come up with uh, uh, to plan your way out of it, right? I mean, so it's a little bit of a an only way out is through approach, but not in a I just want to keep this going, right? I mean, I absolutely want to keep the the act the thing, like lean into art or you know cool projects going. But you don't have to be at full burn all the time to make it work. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's you know when you are it's like uh, well you're your own most important resource right so you just gotta gotta tend to that. Uh, so yeah whatever I admittedly I I know I've been uh, uh, working a bit longer hours and whatnot but. Uh, that's all right. It's uh, it's fun to see the results. I guess that's my addiction is seeing seeing things come together, and uh, then feeling like, oh, cool, that was worth it. Time to take a break, right? And uh, that was recuperate. worth the premature aging that I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I guess I'm gonna if I'm gonna age somehow, I want I want it to um, be worth it. Yeah, you you want you want to pour that youth into something that's being constructed. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Well, yeah, it's just it's, it's it's worth noting that it is a cycle that once you get hooked on making things that uh, it, it will you're going to find I did the same thing. I did the same thing with some uh, lean tart stuff a couple nights ago where it was just one little one more little thing, one more little thing. And um, uh, next thing I knew, I looked at the clock it was two thirty in the morning and I had to be up at eight o'clock. And I'm like, ah, this isn't going to be this isn't going to be good. Uh, <laughs> And then plus, plus, plus again, you're in that mindset, right? You're in that mindset of excited about building something, and it's really hard to go to sleep after that. You know, you you, you got to have a cool down. It's um, things that that will make the addiction worse is finding good ways to compensate for the those issues issues you mentioned, right? The ability to cool down fast. Yeah. I have no idea how the heck this worked, but right around in in like eighth grade health, the uh how the teacher explained going to sleep made so much sense. And so I just like, oh, okay. Explain it to me. I'll, I need to hear this. Just, uh, uh, the gist of it is, like now it's just this emotional feeling, and I remember when I, when I learned it, but uh, uh, to unpack it, it's about just setting aside whatever you're currently working on and knowing it'll be there and... Uh, essentially just breathing and blanking your mind and allow your body to do its work. So essentially shut the brain off, let the body take over and body's going to say, well, guess what, man, it's time to sleep. <laughs> You've made me go far enough today. <laughs> and, and I don't know how, but uh, that works. That sounds me. like meditation almost. It, I think it kind of is like that, yeah. but yeah, I didn't get exposed to that till far later. Well, okay, uh, we we needed to do uh, some amending to last the last episode of uh, Lean Into Art, where we were talking a lot about pro- uh, uh, procedural thinking or uh, analytical thinking, 
uh, breaking things down into bite-sized chunks to consume them. And you had a thought on that about like, well, what about people who operate from emotion, right? Yeah, I, I've occasionally been and have met many artists uh, that, that operate incredibly effectively out of being more emotional, where I know that I will think about uh, a, a goal and a plan and, and picture this thing I want to build, but, um, but don't, I don't always, I don't as often go on this path that when I see it, it's so clear and bright and different than my typical approach that I also appreciate it. And I see it's really effective when uh, artists are like, yeah, I just got home and I painted. And that was it. And and they allowed their emotions to take over and whatever came out, came out. And it wasn't about, I'm going to address this topic in my painting. Or, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, I, this action or pose I want to put here, it's just, there's something in them and then it comes out. Yeah. And that's that can be very effective. But I would say that those things don't have to be fully um, separate. They, I think... I mean, we all have have a you know pretty a shared set of human materials that make us up, right? And you know, some of us may be more of one style or another, but we're not as far apart as on the surface it may seem. When you look at someone that that's coding like a cool JavaScript thing, and someone who's just who's throwing paint at a canvas, they don't necessarily have to be that different. I mean, they're both creating, right? You know what it reminds me of um, is I did I did a, a, a talk a couple of years ago on why superheroes communicate and uh, and and I've talked extensively uh, in in other audio things about how one of the values I think that you, entertainment for young people uh, cartoons you know kids stories one of the values that th that they have as well as superheroes is it allows you to role play. It allows you to play act at being an adult before you're an adult. So, like, oh, I subscribe to Spider-Man's philosophy. I subscribe to Superman's philosophy. Very different characters. Same thing with cartoons. I've talked about this before. You know, cartoons like G.I. Joe, Real American Hero, all these characters presented you with alternate alternatives to uh, a worldview or an approach to living when you get older, right? I want to be more like gung-ho when I grow up kind of thing. But... There's an impl there's an implicit problem in presenting information that way because it's it's sort of like a a, a, a pre high school version of what you do in high school where it's like well I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be the uh, country western kid I'm gonna be the punk kid I'm gonna be the the mod kid mod do you remember mods when you were in high school were they around or was that like just like a very short lived uh, thing Let's see a little bit where maybe they. Uh... I feel like they've kind of brought back. No, that that might be the. I might be thinking of hippie, um, well, hippie style. But. Mods in the '60s. I didn't know this, but yeah, mods in the '60s was a, spe a specific thing. But like, you know, I was in high school in the late '80s, early '90s, and uh, the there was this brief period where the kids who listened to the Cure and like did up their hair really big, you know, and like tried to look like whatever that guy's name was from the Cure, um, Robert Smith. Robert Smith. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the, everybody called them mods for some reason. They all wore all black and all leather, and they painted their fingernails black and acted all sad all the time. But anyway, you know, it's like you go through that thing in high school where you try on identities, figure out who the heck you're going to be and everything. And, you know, unfortunately, some people never outgrow that. Like, they, they got their identity, they got their little niche that they fit into, and, like, this is the way I'm going to operate after all. But the threshold to growing up is figuring out that oh well i'm actually all of these things and everybody's all of these things and because i talk a lot about breaking things down and turning it into some kind of like systematized way of thinking about it like here's like a you know um when i'm working on a story i start with a theme uh that's not to say that that's all I think about or that I don't go back and forth between working from characters, working from premise or plot or setting and zipping back and forth between those things. That's happening very naturally in my brain uh, after doing a couple different you know, graphic novels. Uh, now I know how to go naturally between those two different states. And, and what's more is... Um, where, was, where the hell was I going with this? <laughs> well. There's there's those uh, multiple ways to look at it. You're trying on the the different roles, uh, which is oh. a lot like role playing. 
Yeah, it is a lot like that. But then where, where I was going with this is there are times where analysis fails me or where I approach it from a standpoint of like I've described this before. Like when I'm writing dialogue for a scene, a lot of times that dialogue will not actually be there, but I'll have a rhythm for it. Like I'll actually hear in my head, and I know that that's, and I'll have the emotional context of what's being said, like, right? Or, uh, people should watch the video to see the gesturing that I'm doing. <laughs> yeah. But, but, um, like, it's good. But yeah, I'm, I'm totally overacting. Uh, I'm a terrible actor and I know it. But, but anyway, what I'm saying is, is that, I don't know what is actually being expressed explicitly, but I have a general idea. I have this gut reaction. I have this emotional way of approaching it. I also know, like when I'm writing a scene sometimes, that I want it to feel like this. Like when my brother, Elliot, when he makes theme music for me for like the different audio projects, I don't say to him, well, it should have this in the middle eight, and it should have this kind of build, and you should use a lot of uh, you know, sweep arpeggios and whatnot in here. I don't, I don't come at it with that kind of like mathematical or analytical approach. I go, you know that scene in The Wrath of Khan where this happened? Could you make something that feels like that, right? And that's how I write sometimes, too, is, oh, I, I know how I want this to feel. Uh, so, that, you know, and yeah, I'm doing this, I'm reflecting on this afterwards, and I'm putting words to it afterwards, but... Uh, this is all to say that I think the majority of us operate and oscillate between those two different kinds of like analytical, this is what I intend to do, or this is what I have to do. This is what's in me and it needs to come out and I don't, I can't express it in words right now, but I can throw this paint on the canvas and you'll see what was inside of me. Does that, does that sound like what you're getting at? It, yeah, it totally does. Um, I think it's like what you're describing is, uh, feelings are going to come in somewhere for pretty much everybody who creates it's it's um, sometimes the feelings are more um, are the guiding goal for the analysis, right? Where the analysis may, may come in when you need to execute, or the feelings may come in when you need to execute. But like, uh, it's really not an either or thing. It's it's right. a it's a mix that that could be different for everyone, and even on different projects, um, or maybe even different mediums. Because I know um, my approach does vary a bit like depending if I'm going to code or draw or play music. Right. Uh, it also reminds me of something that I was uh, encountering in one of my uh, comics classes for adults where a student was drawing a scene where she was, uh, it was, it was a memoir and she was chronicling uh, this, this really kind of a frustrating week that she was having where is the whole lot of events lined up to, you know, kind of like, prevent her from doing what she wanted to do with her time. And, you know, it was like car repairs and like the car repairs were really expensive. And then she had to wait around a long time for the estimate call to come in from the mechanic. We've all been there. Right. And she's showing all these scenes in her panels that are very diagrammatic or um, documentary, documentary style where it's like, I'm looking at the phone, looking at me pacing, looking at, uh, you know, the kitchen and, sure. And I'm looking at it, and it just it didn't really say to me how this moment felt. And so I said, well, you know, it's not enough to deliver the story data of what happened. you got to show me how this moment feels. When that phone rang, how did that feel? Was it relief? Was it anticipation? Was it ap apprehension? How did that feel? And how can you show me a viewing angle of that phone or you when the phone rings? How can you design the ring of the phone so that it actually expresses how you felt about that moment? And then when he says, it's going to be 700 bucks. How do you design that moment to make it feel that way too? So like, even if you're not an emotional person, if you are a person who operates in a very analytical way, you've got to get into that mindset if you want to be a visual communicator because a lot of storytelling is emotion, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, you, it's such an ebb and flow back and forth between learning the patterns and the ways to somehow uh, deliberately convey emotion where it's it's like you you are uh, putting your emotion into it to figure out how you can convey the emotion, and then that's the idea what you want to see out of the result. It's not a guarantee. It's going to be up to anyone who who looks at your art, but uh, chances are using your own experience as a guide and you know how, what, for instance, in your example, what um, what feels small instead of saying explicitly having a um, a person, shown very small in the in the panel and then the camera angle way up or uh you know 
somehow do some sort of false perspective that that unifies two different scenes or something where there's a guy on the phone and he's very large and the person the the woman with the bad news hearing is is very that stuff will just probably come out as you are exploring it based uh, informed on how that makes you feel chances are other people would feel that way too in mm -hmm. that situation right uh, it's it's like trying to channel empathy but then all of a sudden deliberately express it and capture it where likely that's a very much a back and forth uh, experience between uh, say, thinking uh, for, for, like if you're thumbnailing and all of a sudden you recognize oh that reminds me of this kind of camera angle perfect so you're going, you're you're having this dialogue with yourself to discover, which is a kind of it's a very much an analytical, iterative process. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, but that's not to say that there aren't artists out there who can just go straight to the page, right? Totally. I mean, I'm sure there are. Uh, I can't, but uh, I'm sure there are people who are absolutely at ease with going straight. Well, Kirby supposedly, reportedly, he could go almost entirely straight to the page and just start in the upper left hand corner and start drawing like a like a dot matrix scanner or i mean printer and create the image as if it was just there in his head from the start you know it, it's all different disciplines uh or different uh, approaches compression of the same skills though I, I would bet so he probably did it all in his head yeah he may have grokked it so deeply inside himself or maybe he was born with that talent exact inside himself in that way right that can happen too we each have our own you know natural shortcuts that are just easier for us um, but it's probably the same steps just in his head yeah so what's the headline here what's the headline that we were trying to say with this whole talking about feelings and emotion uh, well it's it was uh, just reflecting back on our prior podcast and thinking that uh, well um, as creators I think there's really not just one mode to, to be in. I think when we're interested in, in teaching a topic, we'll probably be more leaning toward getting analytical, and that's kind of our role, right? Mm -hmm. so, but we don't have to highlight that as the only way to do it. There's, there's other great approaches, and um, if you're guided more by your emotion as a creator or your analytical tools and techniques, both are fantastic ways to create and we'll be exploring both uh even though you may hear us highlight that analytical stuff quite a bit so yeah well you kind of i mean just just to be fair you kind of have to when you are talking about something like this right like you can't yeah you can't have like a roundtable discussion on creativity just be like well it felt good well it felt bad <laughs> well, it made me angry. Well, it made me happy. You know, if you're just operating purely on emotion, then you don't have a whole lot to talk about. I mean, if you're going to exchange ideas, you have to, you know, kind of get words to it. So there's there's a, a, a sort of a demand for uh, analysis at that point. But uh, we can all get along, and we want all these people to get along. And that's my segue. Hey, how about that? How's that for a segue into talking about what we got? Uh, some of the things we're thinking about for 30 classes and 30 days coming up. And uh, right. I should say, you know, I didn't say this at the top, but uh, as we're recording this, we're recording this again in uh, Adobe Connect. And uh, there's a video that accompanies this podcast. You can watch the video. Uh, you don't have to watch the whole thing. You can just listen to the podcast after the fact if you want to. But you can at least flip through the video a little bit to see what this uh, software is going to look like, what we're going to be using for a lot of these classes. And uh, you can flip through a couple different slides in my presentation. Rob's got a presentation going on at the same time. So you can flip through. Um, look at that. So we can, we can bombard you with information in our yeah we're going to uh uh make you feel like a character in a sci-fi movie leveling up we're just going <laughs> to like five presentations all at once and then like you'll you'll need that emotional part of your brain to to suck it all in yep but uh, yeah yeah it's going to be like max hedrum blipverts where it's going to like just every corner of the screen is just going to be flashing the whole time and until <laughs> until you puff up and explode lean into the, subliminal art <laughs> <laughs> um but uh okay so but you know what i also realized while we we're, d we're talking about this there's a chat client going on uh that people can actually participate in while we're talking we could actually do some of these episodes live 
like actually let people know when we're doing it and they could participate via chat. We could. Yeah. Absolutely. We don't have to, but. Working with a live audience uh, will be fantastic for, for the uh, classes, but the podcast, that'll work. That'll work as well. Because um, I, I assume that I'm, yeah. I'm going to type in the chat right now to see if this gets recorded after the fact. So, hi, Rob. I like you so, so much. Exclamation point. And then uh, we'll see if that gets recorded into the video after the fact. Because uh, it'd be cool. I mean, we would have basically a running commentary that would actually get incorporated into the final show. So Okay. Uh, thanks for your kind words. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to over-encourage that. <laughs> <laughs> You know, this, this is going to be something I, I work on every episode is how can I say something to make Rob uncomfortable? <laughs> but you can pay me back. You can pay me back. Next time we get together in the same location, you can just invade my personal space somehow. <laughs> I, invade, I invade people's personal space with words. <laughs> Darn so, right. That's a good way to do it, actually. <laughs> I think words are actually more hurtful. They stick with you longer than physical pain. Well, I mean, I suppose if I like cut your arm off or something, that's that's a lifetime thing. But, but for yeah. the most part, in in a, in, a, in a larger sense, if I say something very cruel to somebody, that's gonna stick with them for a long time. That's one of the reasons I'm so careful about what I or try to be careful about what I say. Like the three like big regrets I have in life are things that I said to somebody, not things that I physically did to somebody. You know. Oh, interesting. Yeah, for me, it's probably a hybrid. So, <laughs> you were saying terrible things to them while you were punching their eye. <laughs> uh, you know, playground type stuff, you know? Yeah. You were saying that uh, there is no God while you were punching them. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. No, well, okay. Well, the, the time when I, I don't know if I, yeah, I guess I regret the time when I went to kindergarten. I told everyone there's no Santa Claus. Oops. No, you did? <laughs> I did that. I was that kid. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> I so wasn't that kid. I would, be, I would have been the kid who was crying when you did that. I know. Yeah. Well, Jersey, I'm... Um, I know I'm smiling and whatnot. It's, a, it's an awkward <laughs> thing. You know, I... Well, <sighs> with, 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 you know, you hopefully get over that stuff. You know, I mean, there were kids who were mean to me in school, too, because I was a weird kid. Uh, I don't dwell on it. I laugh about it now because I'm a grown-up and I've learned to find, you know, my own sense of uh, self-esteem and value in other places, not in whether Chris was nice to me in fifth grade, right? But but then again, that th that stuff can, you know, can have that lasting effect, which is why you know, I try to be careful with my words. But anyway, that was, that was a, I don't know, what, what the heck do we call that, what we just did, but uh, 30 classes in 30 days and uh, bringing people together so they don't fight on the playground so that they they, they uh, form a community how do you do that what do we what do we what do we hope to do or how, what is our uh, initial strategy we, I, let me let me back up just for a second and interrupt myself as I usually do and say that we're recording these episodes we're starting these episodes before we're done developing the entire project um, so you know by the time you're listening to this, we probably have a lot of this stuff figured out, but we're kind of capturing, to use Rob's language, we're capturing a lot of this development as we do it in our thought processes because I just thought it'd be interesting to share that. Um, sharing yeah. in public. Yeah. Go exactly. We, we are definitely creating in public. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work throughout the, which we mentioned that a bit on the prior podcast, in, in building this and figuring out the... Uh, what what kind of learning environment are we creating through Lean Into Art and what kind of system of podcasts and all these things that, that go into um, what's the experience going to be like for what we share publicly and what will it be like for folks that come in as uh, students on and teachers as well for workshops and classes. And uh, one of the things that, that you know you need to do when you're putting together a project and you want to reach out and, and it's it's about communicating and this is about connecting and, and sharing information and, and uh, being a facilitating helpful place for learning the, the topic. Well, there's a whole lot of things to set up, um, but one thing we have in common with any creative effort is spreading the word. And uh, uh, and we also have this, we're building it iteratively and, and, and all that. 
So it'd be kind of fun to spread the word as we're building it and do it in a in a really fun, exciting gesture, which is thirty classes in thirty days, right? Right. Uh, and one of the one of, of the one of the issues with um, distance learning, doing learning systems that are operating online, is you don't have that uh, physical presence of actually being in the classroom with your peers, right? or being in the lab with your peers, whatever environment you want to describe it as, right? Um, and while I wasn't the kind of guy when I was in college who was making a whole lot of like lifelong friends in those classrooms, uh, there were a couple people, you know, when we had to work on a group project or something that I got along with okay. And, uh, you know, it was, it was, I looked forward to the labs with them because it was fun to work with them and whatnot. And you forge relationships that way. Well, how do you, how do you create that in a digital environment, you know? Now, I, I had been exploring this a little bit through things like the Art and Story podcast where we had uh, different art challenges that happened in the Art and Story Forum. We had the Tumblr account, which we were inviting uh, par participants in, uh, in the podcast community to post work based on challenges that we would throw out on the show. Uh, that's one way to do it. But, uh, you know, a, 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 an explicit group challenge of some sort, like either a contest or, well, let's talk about like one of the inspirations for um, 30 classes in 30 days is... Uh, uh, Tyler James is 30 characters in 30 days, right? That That's a huge uh, event now. Uh, and, and it's something that a lot of people become buddies through. I mean, how does that happen? Or I guess we should say what the heck it is. Well, yeah, as, as far as what it is, it's um, it's essentially uh, a, a community of artists that, that are openly invited to commit to this challenge before November starts. And... Uh, once you do, then the arrangement is uh, to design a character or define a character through a story, or both, for every day in November. And it's one of the thing, one of those things where whether you, if you do this professionally or or you do this, um, maybe you do part of it professionally, and you're exploring the other aspect, like writers are trying out the art or uh, artists trying out writing. It's um, everyone has their reasons for coming to try that out because it sounds it's 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 a it's a tantalizing goal to say that I made something new every day, right? Yeah. That lives up to this thing. Uh, and what's wild about it is this other aspect of of all of us collectively going toward it, and the inspiration of seeing each other performing as as you go along and talking about that. So you do make connections, and you have that shared experience. Um, and what's it? Heck, some of some of pe some people join it as teams, where there's collaborations between a writer and an artist. So, it's wild that it's a catalyst. The event itself isn't like overly prescriptive of the experience that you have to have with the event. It's it, uh, but it's a platform where everyone gets to be a part of it and yeah. make what they want to make out of it. It's like so it's a. Really Really cool setup. It's like a sporting event, isn't it? It's like, I mean, it's not. It's not unlike a sporting event. Totally. Yeah, there's spectators too, and yeah. and supporters. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. So I, I mean, well, uh, yeah. I just think about like one of the things that happened with the art and story podcast, where you know the the implicit agenda of the show. I mean, well, maybe explicit because in the earlier episodes we had uh, a longer intro piece of music. And one of the things we used to say on there is. Uh, you know, we're going to hit every angle of making comics and maybe get you a little bit more excited about making your own comics. And so, you know, that was an intent. Let's get people excited about participating in this medium, right? Uh, but when you say, just like when you go up to somebody and say, like, this is an example I use in my classes all the time. You can't go up to somebody and say, tell me a story. Because they're going to be like, op, op, op. And then if I say, well, tell me a story about your seventh birthday party. And then they're like, oh, now I got a place to start from. I got to by giving me a limitation, you give me a place to begin, so I can start building a story here. Uh, you say to people, create, <laughs> just make things. It's fun. You're not giving them. I mean, a really dedicated and plugged in, enthusiastic person should be able to run with that. But uh, sometimes it can be incredibly incentivizing to say, create this thing in this amount of time and see if you can do it. And you know what? All these other people are going to be there with you doing it, and you, all, you just like in a in a <laughs> when I was in track, and I, I actually did a couple sports in high school, and I was in uh, track in ninth grade, uh, and I sucked. I was awful. I was I was last for every race. Um, 
there was one race where the uh, the announcer left his mic on by accident, and I heard him making fun of me the whole time as I was coming in, like twenty minutes later than everybody else, you know. Uh, but my my best buddy John, he would he would be like, let's see who can actually come in the latest, you know. And so like he and I would compete to be the worst on the team. And just having that person there with me to, uh, you know, go through this stuff made it a lot more fun to do, right? Like, it just as if we were competing to be the best. Um, having that kind of friendly competition uh, in, in inspires you to move forward, gives you that extra strength, and uh, helps you forge connections with people that uh, otherwise you would have very little to talk about with. Uh, or, or maybe it would be difficult to begin a conversation with them because, like, you know, like, one of the common wisdoms that gets punched around the internet, uh, at least used to, is... Um, you know, how do you find your art buddies? Well, I'll go on some uh, art forums and just start talking to people. Well, how do you do that? How do you go into a forum and be like, hi, I make comics and I like to draw. And who else likes to draw? Uh, everybody's going to raise their hand, right? Yeah. It's, uh, well, it's, it's the social context. And, and it's, it's a lot. Of, it's, a, it's a cool weave of a bunch of different things. Because, yeah, the social context gives you the uh, platform to say, oh, hi, this is me. And actually, that's part of how uh, Tyler facilitates it as well. So the host of an event can really affect uh, the feel of, of the event and sort of the, the seed and the culture surrounding it. And uh, I, one of the things that, that he encourages everyone to do is to do this, in, to, to do an initial post introducing yourself for everyone who's officially a part of the, like, that site's challenge. Um, and in general, having a very inclusive feel where both there's no limits as far as who joins other than the date that's part of the contract yeah you know we're we're sharing this experience over this time um so yeah people can take it more seriously and whatnot uh so but uh, yeah anyway no complete your thought there you, you look like you were oh, about to it's just a, it's just a great way to uh, to to see it and kick it off, which provides a context for people who may be a little more um, unsure what to reach out to. Because there's people that that join thirty characters in in thirty days that are super talented artists that are are very good at rendering um, art in a way that is. I mean, they're professionals, right? Yeah. And at the same time, there's many of us that that were. Uh, you know, so sort of in between doing some professional work and, and, you know, still on our path. And then there were some people who were just starting out and uh, said, you know what, I can draw a stick figure, but enough people were there already saying, come on, it's all right. They, you know, they joined. Um, so, but in that context, it's like, well, what does it matter your skill level? We all, we're all here to share this together and in yeah, the, the interesting thing there is that you're prioritizing the completion of the project over the quality of the work, aren't you? I mean, you still want to do good quality work, and you want to you you are you're engaging in this because you want that kind of critique and interaction and in, input from your peers on this. But the top priority is finishing, not proving what an awesome illustrator you are, right? That's the battle that everyone faces with themselves for for the event, though. Because most of us will want to only share something we feel that is, you know, up to that test. And especially if you're like, well, there are, um, let's see, I could, uh, I, I could go pull up the site to remember some more names, but um, people like uh, Daniel Govar, right, where uh, he renders some very beautiful realistic characters. And you're like, my God, he's looking at my stuff. I can't post this thing. It's not ready, right? Uh, it, and the people people battle that with, with art challenges, and that's that's where it's not just an art hangout and an art silly times. It's it's an art challenge. There's a reason why it's hard, and sometimes I, I would say for that one, that's like the hard part. That's the hurdle is producing and doing it consistently every day. Versus um, dealing with uh, being overly specific about exactly what you finish, but of course, it's a as you get practice and you get more comfortable. Of course, you can crank up the challenge. If delivering art at a certain level of rendering um, or a certain level of completion that you're like, well, I could do better, try, and and you can make it as hard or easy as you want. Mm -hmm. And I'm reminded of something that uh, 
I heard happens in art school, not having finished art school myself, not even having gone to a real art school, um, critiquing class, you know, like you have to sometimes like when you're like finishing your degree, you have to select pieces that uh, you can defend, you know, the 10 pieces that you will fight for, I think is the terminology that I've heard people use. Mm -hmm. And, um, and when I talk to some of my former students who go off to college, they talk about like their critiquing class and what faces them as they are selecting those pieces. And they're like, you know, this just makes me sweat putting together my portfolio for looking for freelance work. And I said to them, I was like, wow, you know, I mean, in freelancing, you, you don't have to do that whole defense of your work. You know, you just put the pieces that you, the artist, feel are great. And, uh, the clients will come or they won't and you you know update your portfolio as needed but there's so much less pressure in that environment but when you're in that critiquing class there's this whole notion of having to defend your ideas and i wonder if that's what uh, is also part of this this game that you're talking about is like um you're engaged in this and maybe yeah you're not as uh skilled as so and so professional who's done you know character concept design work for ea games or the movies and whatnot but as long as you can defend what you did and just and, dis- and demonstrate some kind of intentionality whether it is some kind of emotional or intellectual intentionality that went into this design to show that you weren't just kind of going bah, 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 drawing with like your left hand or you know drawing with your eyes closed um then you've achieved something there i mean is that am i getting anywhere with that uh, no, I think you absolutely are. To me, it's it sounds like um, it's the you're reminding me that that one of the tension points it's it's between theory and practice, basically, where um, both in the case of of um, thirty characters in thirty days, you're signing up for a, a commitment to deliver something. A lot like signing up to deliver something to a client, and you know you use it your best within within certain limitations. And when you take away the limitations, it's less about exploring the finishing. It's more about exploring the theory or demonstrating the theory and your technique or whatnot that uh, uh, that becomes the the uh, indication of quality. Uh, and those things can be pretty tense opposing forces. Yeah. But as is, as is anything, though, I mean, like, when you're creating something, there, if there's not a bunch of tension, if there isn't, like, some kind of anguish in the actual creative process, then what's the point of doing it? Uh, it's like, I think of that line from uh, that TV series, Home Movies, where Coach McGurk says to Brendan Small, if you're not immediately good at something, Brendan, it's not worth doing, you know? <laughs> uh, and and he's, he's obviously presenting the opposite point of view that we should have, but... Yeah. But I mean, you know, I don't know. It's, I think that that struggle stuff is 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 a uh, uh, hand wringing as it might sound sometimes is actually a good thing because that's what's going to actually create interesting stuff is sweating those tensions. Exactly, and putting yourself in there uh, firsthand, where you're not not just spectating. It's cool to be a spectator and, and support and um, and learn by observing, but. It's when you're in there firsthand that you experience those tensions and you start learning your own trade-offs and how you want to to make them. It's it's a great way to build experience. Yep. So uh, do you have any ideas on what we might do for our, our uh, 30 30 challenges? Because we've been talking about that a little bit. Uh, well, we've, uh, let's see, as you mentioned, uh, 30 classes in 30 days is... And we're actually going to be doing this the same month as 30 Characters in 30 Days, mm-hmm. uh, which uh, we look forward to connecting more with with that project uh, and with Tyler James on all this. But uh, um, 30 Classes in 30 Days is more of a learning challenge. And uh, I th- there will be definitely things to produce and create, but the emphasis will be more about exploring, I think, the connections between a, a variety of creative disciplines and techniques and tools. Yeah. We were talking about creating like a, a, a public, well, I, I say like we were talking about this like it may not happen, but it's going to happen. Uh, we're going to have like a public area where the works of people who participate in this project will be on display, right? Oh, yeah. Pub- the, there, there will be a, um, the, uh, right now we're calling it the, uh, the student showcase yeah, and that's a it's a really important part of our um, our our community at Lean Into Art, where we want to uh, we want to have that dialogue with students that that um, and and teachers everyone that's that's participating in our community 
that wants to share their work and uh, uh, and discuss it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 both be a place where you can have that that safe discussion behind a uh, behind some kind of uh, partition, keeping you so the public isn't necessarily uh, privy to what's being discussed. Right. Just like just like in a traditional classroom, if you're having a critique review, it's not out in an auditorium and broadcast on television. But but there, there is some part of it that we're in the Internet age, and uh, I think that uh, sharing this process publicly is an important thing. I think it's a valuable thing. Um, seems like these days it's not... Uh, people are just accustomed to this idea of getting all the behind-the-scenes and thought process along with the thing, too, nowadays, right? Uh, young people are just accustomed to getting that along with the stuff, like, you know, knowing instinctively what the Tumblr account is of all their favorite cartoonists or creators, um, not just knowing where their YouTube channel is. So, um, yeah, I mean, I just think it's, it's, it's just, it, these days it's just a natural thing we expect. And uh, but, but on top of it, there is a lot of value to be had in, uh, like you would say, capturing and documenting and sharing that sort of process, that, that intellectual justification for what you did or emotional justification. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a good practice, and obviously we'll we'll be providing a um, a platform for for doing that practice, and uh, I'm I'm betting that there will be a lot of work that uh, that comes out of uh, 30 classes in 30 days. Um, and uh, let's see, should we talk about any of them specifically, or sure we can. We, we probably should release. Um, I would like to not just flood it because obviously we're still. Uh, we're still working with teachers, and uh, um, you know we we have a schedule that is uh, it's getting revised, and and uh, more and more awesome things are are being brought into it by the day at this mm -hmm. point. At this point, um, yeah. But we know that uh, uh, you know there's certainly some things that will be a core part of it. Um, so I didn't want it to overly tease if we just talk only about, yeah, this event's going to happen, here's some things. But for instance, yeah. like something you might learn is, like you'll be presenting, right, Jersey? <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm just going to sit back and watch. No, yeah, of course I'm going to. I mean, right now at the time of this recording, uh, one of the series of, of workshops that I've proposed for inclusion in this uh, thing, uh, and this could change. Because uh, as we're getting more teachers involved who are proposing a lot of really interesting stuff, it's like, gosh, you know, it's kind of better than what I wanted to do, uh, is uh, my Comics Fundamentals course, like a variation on that, which is a class for adults that I teach in Ann Arbor. I've taught it for two years now. Uh, it's based upon a lot, of, a lot of teaching I've done over the last five years. It's uh, sort of a uh, six-week course that I did, uh, which is sort of like a soup-to-nuts approach to making a comic story. Um, Obviously, I would have to heavily modify it for 3030 because uh, there's not six weeks in the month to do that. So I would probably combine a couple of them. And but but each each session has an uh, action item of here's the assignment. Here's the thing you should do for preparation for discussion on next week's episode or n next week's class. Uh, so things like one of the classes concludes with go for a walk with a digital camera and uh, or a sketchbook. And uh, do not think about anything in particular. Go to a favorite place, a place where you can clear your mind, a place where you can feel at ease and relaxed. And the moment you see something interesting that just makes you go, hey, you know, and I don't want anything as, it, it, any more fully formed as a thought than just that. Capture it. Take a picture of it. Draw it. Whichever. And then the following week, we bring back the pictures or sketches and we review them as a group. And then my job as the instructor is to find the common threads between the, the different pieces that they did. So like one student, uh, there was like a, a lot of focus on depth. Like all of the pictures had something framing uh, a distant object. Like So like b tree branches in the foreground, an object way off in the distance. And that was like, it was in nine out of every ten photos that this person showed me. And so I said, well, wow, look at this. Uh, did, were you thinking about that when you did it? No, it just looked cool. Oh, well, then this is uh, something to think about in your work is 
incorporating, as you make a comic, uh, incorporating lots of shots with a lot of sense of depth to it because it's something you gravitate towards, something you have a natural inclination for. Um, so that's the kind of like um, uh, instructional and reflective kind of uh, activities that would be available in, the, in that course. Uh, but then also, you know, completing comics pages based on these little mini exercises. So then the, the intent is by the end of it, you at least have a couple comics pages done and a real clear sense of how you can finish this project. You know, having a sense of this is what it's going to be about. These are the characters. This is how, how long it's going to be. And here's a couple pages to get me off and going. So after you're done with the class, you can finish a book. Uh, you you bringing up uh, the 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 flow of your class, which which sounds really fun. I'm hoping to have some some time to actually experience some of the classes too when I hear that. I'm like, man, this is going to be so fun. But that, that, <laughs> I'm picturing a few things. There's the format format of the class, which will be sort of a um, more of a um, seminar workshop in the in the brief compared to where you know something that may be too plus hours of material really we're going to be uh, doing in, in, uh, slices of, of, of those learning modules right where mm -hmm. they it may not be um, you wouldn't have to go to eight hours of class 30 days in November right right <laughs> <laughs> that would be um, less of a challenge more torture uh, <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. We want it to be tough, but not uh, not insane. No, I should so, say that, yeah, the Comics Fundamentals course is typically two hours, but uh, it would probably be a little bit shorter in a, in a web version. Um, it'd probably be more like a, oh, um, hour to hour and a half, followed by some kind of lab time afterwards, right? Yeah, and, and that's... That's part of what we'll be providing is a variety of these experiences as well. So you mentioned lab time, and uh, some of what we'll what we'll have is sort of a shared creative time in yep. the um, in this live environment. Actually, uh, we'll be using uh, Adobe Connect yeah. for that. And, so yeah, uh, shared creative time, instructional time where there's like a presentation slash interactive discussion, and then. Um, in the commons, in the uh, the sort of the, on the website, sort of time shifted area where it's like a forum kind of thing. That's where you get to interact with the other classmates. That's where you can post the the, the pieces that you've been working on. And so, like a class, right? Like, what what what's the uh, the the common wisdom on this? Is if I remember right, it was like for every hour of uh, for every credit hour you take in college, uh, you're expected to do four to eight hours of homework. Is that right? Does that sound familiar to you? Uh, Heard that measure? I thought you were um, going in the in the direction of creating that hour because it's a <laughs> it's a lot more work than an hour. Um, yeah, it is. <laughs> no, it, it definitely is. Yeah, for every for every credit hour that you experience, that's at least five to ten hours on the part of the instructor yeah. to create. Yeah. Well, exactly. And depending on the topic, uh, potentially even more. Yeah. Um, it's uh, yeah. I've I've heard that kind of rule of thumb. But I would bet it varies based on school and culture, and uh, sure. But instructor. where I'm going with that is, is that we're talking about an hour and a half of class time. Maybe if you want to do it all together with lab, it's maybe two to two and a half hours. That's what I could see being uh, appropriate for a comics fundamentals course. Um, but then the student is expected to do several hours worth of work between each session in order to meet the goals of the course, right? So, yep. I mean, we're talking about, even though you're not talking about like eight hours of class a day, you are talking about a pretty, just like how 30 characters in 30 days is, oh my gosh, that's, um, let's say one character design takes two hours, right? That's two hours a day for a whole month. That's 60 hours you're putting in on this project. And that's like oh, yeah. keeping it lean, right? So... Oh yeah, and it's it's all too easy to have um, some of those turn into a short story and a character that you rendered a lot, and then you know, well, from my experience, I participated in both the uh, 2009 and 2010, 30 characters in 30 days, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, it was intense. <laughs> my wife keeps asking me, "Are you going to do it again this year?" <laughs> <laughs> and I just laugh, but 
You know, uh, you know, it'd be cool. And this is totally like pie in the sky wish thinking is wouldn't it be cool if we could also create like a live video? Oh, oh here's how you do it. You do it through Google Plus. You create a hangout that's just never ending of um, a 24 hour comic sort of room where, you know, people could just be working on 24 hour comics and it's just it's just an open hangout that's just set up and accessible through the Lean Into Art website or something like that. I don't know That's if we true. can pull that off on top of everything else we got to do, but that is something we could think about as possible events to run on the site down the road or something like that. That's something I'm thinking about doing for Kids Read Comics 2012 is actually have like um, an open Skype connection set up in a room and a projected screen where cartoonists mm -hmm. could all and have it be a not a 24 hour comic room, but like a one hour comic room, like from noon to 1 p.m. We're doing one hour comic and it's in this room in the library. But guess what? You can also participate anywhere in the world at that time and we'll broadcast you on the so we have this, this big tiled screen of all these little video windows of uh people all doing their one hour comic kind of thing i love that i and i, I love seeing what the um like captured video of like when the space shuttle or whatnot would do that with classrooms or the space you know, international yeah. space station uh yeah bringing people together at the same place at the same time even if it's virtual there is a, a more depth to that shared experience um right. where we don't just have that. So your your um, comics fundamentals class will be very much a. Um, there's a lot of live experience in it. There's yeah. some follow. There's follow up as well. So there's a bit of time shifting, quite a bit of live. But other other um, classes we'll be presenting will be um, more time shifted. That's so true. the shared experience aspect will be in those, like in the commons on on the leanintoart.com site, right? Right. Uh, or uh, or in other channels, hanging out on Twitter and hashtags and whatnot. Uh, it's a more flexible, time shifted way, but uh, occasionally bringing us together. So uh, with these uh, focused um, li uh, live classes and with labs, so kind of an interplay between a mul multiple styles of sharing that information. Right. Right, just like how we're doing this kind of sharing right now where I've got a uh, PDF open in one pane, you've got a PDF open in another pane, then we've got this this uh, whiteboard that we can interact with. Um, a lab could be something very similar where somebody shows up, they say, hey, you want to look at this PDF? We put it up on the screen and we talk about it as a group. Um, you know, can you look at this JPEG file of this thing I've been working on and we'll talk about it as a group. We'll all interact with it. We can draw on top of these PDFs too, if I'm not mistaken. I'm going to try it. I'm going to draw my PDF. I love your fearless adoption of the technology. <laughs> and it's working. And it's working. I'm drawing. Well, let me make the, the marker bigger it's, here. It's really, it's that kind of, uh, this is a fun sandbox, actually. Um, not to just give Adobe a, uh, a a whole bunch of commercial time here, but uh, it's, they really have something that that's pretty unique with, uh, with Adobe Connect, with, um, we can have such a fun sandbox environment where we actually have two presentations on the screen right now and a whiteboard and both of our faces, right? Yep. Um, and we're all hanging out together. Um, Welcome to the it's, future. Yeah. it's, And we can shift and reconfigure. We can make one of them be full screen all of a sudden if we wanted. Um, watch this. Bam. Full screen. <laughs> I just sorry if that was a surprise. Um, let's oh, see. actually, no. it didn't. It didn't change it on my screen. It didn't change it on your screen. Okay, interesting. So wait a minute. So, wait a minute. So you just made your presentation full screen? I did. Oh, let me do it on mine. See what happens. Whoa! Hey, there it is. I'm looking at your presentation all huge, and then I can shut it off and go back to seeing your video again. Yeah. Ah, so there is uh, some flexibility with how. The, um, we as um, instructors and learners get to interact with this yep. tool. So this, these are going to be some fun classes. I think so. I think so too. Um, and yeah, and, and just being able to, like what I'm doing right now on, on, on my presentation is I'm just ex doing some examples of how you could just draw like, okay, take this panel and I circle it just like a, like a sports guy, right? Like when you see like those football play-by-plays where they circle the different things in the field. And I'm like circling this panel, like take this and move it over here and it'll look a lot better. And I draw an arrow showing where to put it. Uh, gosh, that's almost as good as being there, right? You know, so yeah, very, very fun. Um, and I'm, I, I have a question about this this 
character right here, right? Yeah. Um, you just circled somebody's head, put a big question mark. Exactly. Hey, look at this it, right there. Yeah. Yeah. How is, why is he placed this way relative to the rest of the scene? And I just came up with a question, you know, for in, so we can not just say, you know, pronouns and, and use extra description because it's radio. It's like, no, this is video with like annotation. We can write on stuff and get extra specific. And right. I love it. Yeah. You know, I mean, another thing, going back to some of the stuff that where all this kind of evolved out of, um, at least for me, is uh, with the Art and Story show, we did this thing called uh, Art and Story Supreme, where we offered office hours, and I'm doing the air quotes when I say that, um, where listeners of the show could have us, for, each of the hosts, for an hour on Skype anytime they wanted uh, to talk about stuff that they're wondering about in their work. And sometimes they would share like a JPEG or two of their pages. Like, hey, I want you to look at the storytelling moments in this sequence. And I got a thumbnail. And, you know, I, I just want to know if it flows right. Well, then I would have to download the JPEG. I'd open it up in Photoshop. I'd do a couple tweaks on it. And I'd do all the circling and everything. And I'd have to send it back to them over Skype. And then say, okay, now look at that file that I just sent you on Skype. And see that panel that I circled in red and where I moved it. And I'd have to describe what, I'm what I just did, you know. Whereas this is, yeah, a little bit, little bit cooler, a little bit more robust than that. So. Yeah, it just helps to see those things grow li live um, yeah. because the drawing on the screen becomes a, an animated demonstration in and of itself. Mm -hmm. I wonder if it stays there. I'm going to click on another page. Go back. Oh, it does. The drawings stay on the associated slide. It did? Uh, it did not for me, just to let you know. Oh, interesting. Okay. Maybe there's well, a way. We're still figuring out the some of the aspects of the tool. Oh, now now there it is. Okay. Maybe it just took a second to refresh and update itself. Yeah, it could be. Okay. Super neat. Well, okay, I think we've given a good preview of what where we're going to get ahead with this thing, uh, conceptually, and then also with some specific details. Uh, highlighted some of the different kinds of people that we hope will be a part of this thing. Um, I should say, this is where I have to say, um, by the time people listen to this, uh, maybe we'll have already announced what kind of oh sorry, uh, what kind of um, pricing is going to be involved with this. But even if we haven't, the bottom line is this stuff ain't free. It, uh, there's there's a lot of layers of complexity to making something like this, both in terms of developing the content, creating a course is a lot of work. Uh, but then there's also fees incurred from using the software. Adobe Connect is not free. You can look online to find out how much it costs to use Adobe Connect, right? Um, mm -hmm. Running the website, running the different services that we need to implement in order to make this thing a seamless and fun service for people to interact with, that all costs money. So these classes will be fee-based. And uh, like I said, if, if, if it's not in the site now, it will be soon how much it's going to cost in order to take these classes. But... Here's my promise. I'm going to put everything I got into it, and I'm sure Rob is too, to make it absolutely worth every single penny. Absolutely. Or Fennig, or uh, Lyra, or I'm trying to think of some <laughs> other currencies. <laughs> gold I accept gold doubloons. <laughs> Rubles. Uh... <laughs> Whatever digital, uh, we, what's that digital currency that uh, some some people are trying oh, to like? Bitcoin. Bitcoin, yeah. It'll be worth every Bitcoin. It'll Absolutely. Be worth every Zynga buck. <laughs> <laughs> we're going to tie it in with Zynga. Uh, we're going to make this thing completely uh, Facebook-y. And uh, every time you do anything on Lean Into Art, it notifies all your friends on Facebook. I just did a thing. You should too. <laughs> well, uh, w <clears throat> yeah, we'll leave that up to you. You can, <laughs> yeah. By all means, ping your friends on Facebook. Uh, you know, with our name. But uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. Um, we've got actually. What's funny? We do have some fun, fun ideas and plans for stuff in that nature, but not, not in the. I just, um, I just petted a cow. <laughs> Will you pet a cow too? So I get two cows, and stuff like that. <laughs> Is that a real thing? Is yeah. that a <laughs> I think, yeah. I think that's oh its name. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yep. You go in and with with all your computing technology and advancements of humanity and the, the internet and everything, and you click that cow. <laughs> it, it reminds me It reminds me of, like, uh, there was a, 
a comedian who was on the, the TV show Dr. Katz back in the 90s. And this was like right when the internet was starting to take off, AOL and all that stuff. And it was a comedian who was complaining uh, bitterly about a friend of his who was telling him to get online, get online, get online. Because that, that's where everything's happening. He's on the net. And so he gets in this chat room and he's all excited and he's all looking forward to talking with people from all across the world. And the first message that pops up is, ping, do you like dogs? <laughs> <laughs> it was his indictment on how it, all this technology ultimately doesn't make conversation any better because people are still bad at talking to each other. Uh, but that, that it seems like it was the precursor to Farmville. <laughs> Pet the cow. Yeah, totally. Um, I should look that up and add it to the show notes. I, it was actually uh, a, a game designer's sort of uh, uh, critique on that whole world essentially by creating that which but it itself became very popular also <laughs> <laughs> well i remember also talking with a guy a couple of years back who was uh, very resistant to the idea of using social networks and uh and i and i said why well, what's what's your hold up and he said uh well, it's like if I post anything about what I'm interested in, in, in thoughts that I want to, discussions I want to have, complicated ideas that are really worth unboxing, nobody responds to me. But if I say, what should I have for breakfast, Fruit Loops or Cocoa Puffs, I get 45 responses from people all voting for their favorite, right? You know, <laughs> he's like, he's like, so it doesn't raise the level of conversation. You know, you and I know that, well, all technology can be used for good or evil, and it all depends on how you phrase your stuff and what audiences you approach. But uh, I, questions are easy to answer. That's right? true. That's just, true. Yeah, basic opinion. Where at some, I have to actually formulate my thoughts if I'm trying to communicate something actually that's 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 rich or complex. Um, yep. Kind of ties back to our initial conversation. You know, if I need if I if I have an emotional response or something that's more analytical, um, the analytical one is like, man, I'm I'm busy. I'm just in an elevator here checking my Twitter. Yep. So I guess I'll not respond to that. Exactly. All right. Well, I think we're done. Uh, at, at any rate, I got to get motoring in a second here because I got another class to go to. Uh, but where can we find information about our stuff? Uh, if you haven't heard us say the, the words lean into art, it's lean into art dot com. Uh, lean into art on the Twitters. Mm -hmm. um, that's where you go. That's where you go. Everything is there. And uh, any last thoughts? Any last summary statement? No, I think actually um, we ended up tying everything together with the the uh, questions being you know emotional. I know you rock jersey. <laughs> no, we're, we we're both good at this stuff. Yeah, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> I know. I was commenting on, on on Jersey's victory victory pump on video and whatnot. It, oh, no, it, it, it's no, cool. it's I love connecting these topics, and, and I think we I think we did, and we do it because. Uh, because it's a it's a it's a fun exercise and it's beneficial because when you go to create stuff and you're open to connecting things you're going to probably either create it more easily or uh, uh, pull off whatever you were intending to pull off or at the very least it's just fun to think about so that's true <laughs> all right uh, so then we will see you guys next time. Uh, until then, I've been Jersey Drozd of comicsaregreat.com and leanintoart.com. Oh, and Jersey on Twitter. And I have been Rob Stenzinger, which I'm Rob Stenzinger on the Twitter, and you can check me out. Uh, my blog is actually at robstenzinger.posterous.com. Okay. <laughs>